Welcome everyone to this Drug Discovery World webinar entitled Kinetics in Drug Discovery from Assay Plate to Patient. Uh, as we are well aware, the, the study of binding kinetics goes back oh, more than a century and, it, and is the foundation of pharmacological theory as we know it today. The screening assays employed in drug discovery are abstractions of biological systems and by their nature are often poorly predictive of efficacy and potency in patients. Uh, this is caused in part by the use of equilibrium systems to predict patient responses, uh, despite humans being notoriously non-equilibrium in nature. Uh, today's webinar will describe the use and analysis of kinetic methods across the drug discovery journey uh, and their impact for understanding the pharmacology of medicines as a whole. So I'm delighted to be joined today by two speakers. Uh, first up is Catherine Walk from BMG LabTech. Catherine is the Applications Manager for BMG LabTech UK and has 16 years experience with the company assisting users uh, with microplate readers uh, and assay optimization. Uh, Catherine draws on her ex uh, previous experiences in both academia and industry uh, working in the fields of cell and molecular biology. Catherine will hand immediately over to our second speaker, who is Dr. Martin Redhead from UCB. Uh, Martin completed his PhD in pharm uh, pharmacy, uh, or pharmacy rather, at the University of Nottingham, uh, from where he went on to join the Signature Discovery Bioscience Department, working on the kinetics and thermodynamics of drug discovery. He joined UCB in 2015 and works as a group leader specializing in molecular pharmacology and its impact to drug discovery. I'm Robert Jordan, publisher and editor-in-chief of Drug Discovery World, DDW, and I'm going to serve as your moderator today. Um, at any time during the, this webinar, you can send in your questions for our panelists by typing your question in the, strangely enough, ask a question box and pressing OK. Um, the panel will try and answer as many of your questions as time permits at the end of the presentations. Uh, and uh, I do look forward to plenty of questions at the end there. OK, so I think we're ready to go. Um, so if you're sitting comfortably, uh, let's get started. Uh, and you, Catherine, uh, if you're ready to go, the floor is yours. Hi there. Thanks, Robert. Um, my name's Catherine Walk. I'm the Applications Manager with BMG Lab Tech uh, UK in Ireland. I'm uh, really pleased that Martin's able to join us today to talk about the importance of um, and value that kinetics add to the screening process. Um, as a lot of the work that Martin's team have done has been on the Ferristar FSX, um, it's my job from BMG to introduce that instrument and some of the functionalities that Martin's team uh, will have used in, in the data that you see. So if I first of all introduce the Ferris FSX, it's really suitable for all screening assay formats and can handle all plate types up to even a 3, 4, 5, 6 well plate. Um, so with this instrument, we can cover any non-isotopic uh, read technology, so anything fluorescence luminescence-based. We're going to be talking a lot today about TLFRET applications, but also alpha screen um, fluorescent polarization as well. The system itself is highly automatable, um, includes barcode readers and can either be used with stackers or with um, any type of robotics platform. The, re the reader itself was designed with speed and sensitivity in mind. Uh, we have dedicated light sources and also detectors to ensure that we get the best performance out of different assays. So whether it be a spectrometer for absorbance um, or for applications like uh, TRFRET, the option to use either um, a flash sample or laser, I'll talk a little bit more about later on. Um, so with the dedicated detectors uh, for both fluorescence assays, luminescence and TRFRET, these match detectors give us or ensure we get the best sensitivity and having the dual detectors for each application also means we can perform simultaneous dual emission in any application which requires 
to emission readouts. So just to talk a little bit about the basics and some very standard features as well on the instrument um, for filter selection, uh, for applications we use uh, barcoded optical modules. This makes it very easy to use um, and ensures um, that there's no problems uh, between running assays uh, having everything in that one box. So they're barcoded, so for easy recognition. Uh, instrument can measure my, all readings from either top or bottom and it's temperature controlled with shaking capabilities um, built into the system. So all standard type assays can be covered as well as the more complex kinetics. And we also offer uh, solutions for dealing with common problems like uh, glow crosstalk that you may see in luminescence assays, uh, whether it be kinetic or endpoint reads. Uh, crosstalk can come from either above the well in a, in a glow luminescence assay or through the sides of the plastic itself. And with the Ferris RFSX, we have um, apertures built in to be able to um, correct or el eliminate light from traveling across the plate going into the detector. And we also have algorithms, as you can see on the right-hand side of my slide, um, where we have high background wells caused by glow coming through the plastic that can be eliminated by using our algorithm and, and, and tests to establish uh, these effects on the microplate. So to, to talk a little bit more towards uh, what Martin is going to be talking about later on, um, I should talk in particular about TR FRET uh, assays. So TR FRET, as I mentioned previously, we have two different light sources um, to activate this technology, either using our xenon flash lamp or um, our laser. Um, the data on the right-hand side is, is really just showing here that regardless of whether you're using laser or flash lamp, sensitivity is always guaranteed. Um, what the laser gives us as an advantage is, is speed, um, higher energy going in in a faster way. So we can basically achieve high counts with very few flashes of the laser, and this is fantastic advantage for either um, measuring 1536 in, in a rapid way, I mean with on-the-fly measurements of around 36 seconds, um, or where kinetic assays are important, this ability to be able to take multiple time points within the shortest times, and uh, as, as some of Martin's data no doubt will, will testify later on. Um, with respect to uh, TR FRET, um, we, the laser also has a um, a bit of an advantage as well for terbium-based donor systems. So on the right-hand side of, of the bar graph, you can see some of the perfor performance improvements you see in signal window by having a, a laser that is uh, at specifically the right wavelength for, for a terbium readout. So it could be anywhere from 30% to even with some um, lamp screen type technologies up to a 60% improvement in signal window. When optimizing uh, TR for assays, especially if they're inbuilt uh, or in-house built uh, technology assays, um, the system can also uh, perform decay curve monitoring. This allows us to um, see the true decay. It can be also useful for troubleshooting as well, um, if things are maybe working well. Um, we, with time resolved fluorescence assays, we need to determine the point at which we start collecting the light and how long we collect the light for. Um, using this feature for optimization, um, we have an, an inbuilt integration with a wizard in our analysis software that just by choosing whether you want to gauge measurements um, against Z prime or signal window, uh, we can give you an idea of all the permutations um, and the best settings uh, for, for your assay configuration. So this can be very useful in optimizing signal window and, and Z' prime going forward for these assays. Um, now, a lot of the assays that Martin's team will have used uh, may have used um, injectors to initiate responses. Um, this makes um, even the most rapid of kinetics highly automatable. So they're built into the footprint of the Ferrostar, which makes it highly compatible with automation uh, systems. 
the specifications of the injectors um, allow us to be able to inject volumes as little as one microliter, changeable in 0.5 microliter increments, and, and these volumes can be varied across the plate. So it's even possible to create dose response curves uh, with the two injectors that are, are built into the machine. Um, as we're able to inject and read simultaneously, it is possible for very fast readouts to be able to read up to 100 times per second. So, and the user as well can control both speed um, and the timing for, um, for the initiation of reactions. Um, when working with cell layers, for example, uh, lowered speeds for injection would be, would be essential to prevent uh, damage to cell layers. So at this stage, I'm going to just kind of summarize. I think that's kind of introduced some of the key technologies that are within the Ferrostite FSX. Um, what you have with that instrument is a very flexible platform that can read all leading assay technologies. Um, we have simultaneous dual emission in all read modes um, and the higher sensitivity. So for certainly applications with dual readout, such as TR fret, as we're going to talk about today, this gives us both the speed and the sensitivity advantage. And again, from the kinetics perspective, we're looking on and off rate uh, determination, having the injectors for the um, inject and read uh, capabilities is a huge benefit for those types of applications. So at this stage, I'm going to thank you for your attention, but I'm very excited to be able to hand over to Martin at this stage to talk more about how this technology is incorporated in kinetic studies. Thanks. Thank you, Catherine. Um, so I'm Martin Redhead from UCB. I'd like to start off by thanking BMG and Drug Discovery World for inviting me to present this webinar. I'm going to be talking about our approach to using kinetics in drug discovery uh, and where we feel it's made an impact. So I'll start off with a, a brief history of UCB as a company and an introduction to kinetics, as well as a bit on how we measure kinetics and model them. And then I'll try and talk about two case studies we have where we've seen either kinetic methods allow us to discover better drugs or where we've used kinetic methods to improve clinical predictions. So, UCB is a Belgian company that was founded in 1928. Uh, and our first major drug that most people will have heard of is Zyrtec. If you don't recognize a brand name, it's also called Cetirazine dihydrochloride. So if you've got hay fever, you probably know it quite well. In 2004, UCB bought Celtec, which is a British biotech company specializing in antibodies and small molecules. And it's this Celtec site where I work today. The Celtec acquisition led to Simsia, which has been one of our biggest drugs, which is an anti-TNF molecule. And now looking to the future, we have a Venafy, which is a drug for osteoporosis, which has been recently approved in the US and Japan. So I, UCB, I lead the molecular pharmacology group. And when I tell people that, most people reply with, what on earth is molecular pharmacology? So I'll start off by trying to explain what we see molecular pharmacology as. And it's best described as where, where it sits and what it does in a drug discovery pipeline. So we sit within the lead discovery, lead optimization, and a little bit in the preclinical space. We look at early stage hit binding. We look at potency, efficacy, kinetics, and mechanism. And to do that, we measure a lot of parameters. So we might look at percent inhibition, IC50s and EC50s, IMAXs and EMAXs, on and off rates, and mechanisms like competitive and non-competitive. And we believe that to get truly accurate dose prediction, we have to combine all of that above information and put it into a PKPD model. So I'd like to talk a little bit about the history of kinetics in drug discovery, at least I see how I see it and how the academic literature has influenced my opinion. So a long time ago, well, probably not that long ago, but a long time ago, uh, there was brilliant set of papers from Robert Copeland talking about drug target residence time. And this told us that slow off compounds were better. They would sit on our target longer, and it meant that even if the drug levels of drug in the blood had fallen to near undetectable levels, our long off compound would sit on its target and would still inhibit it. And this sounded brilliant. So we all wanted to chase long off inhibitors. 
But a while after this, there was another brilliant paper from a couple of researchers at AstraZeneca in Sweden, where they showed actually, if you have the same affinity, but have either fast or slow kinetics, it could mean that if you're very slow off, you will have to be also slow on. And if you're too slow on, you won't bind your target in time. So this has added a little bit of extra confusion, but I think we were all quite happy chasing our long off compounds. But then Steve Charlton threw a spanner in the works and he showed in a brilliant paper that where a target sits in the local biological architecture also affects the kinetics. And for some receptors, a fast on compound can keep rebinding the receptor. So this long residency is in fact driven by a fast on rate instead. And there was another brilliant paper from Steve's group where they showed depending on the kinetic rate which drove the effect, so either fast on or slow off, you could see different types of side effects for different compounds. And this might seem like it's all sort of confusing, disjointed information, but for me it was telling one very clear narrative throughout it all. And that's that kinetics in drug discovery are really important, but they're only important in the context of the wider biological system in which we're thinking about them. So perhaps now I should take a little bit of time to explain what I mean when I'm talking about kinetics. So often, if we think about a drug binding to a target, we might think of a dose response like this. It's a sigmoid and we're measuring it in equilibrium. And when I say equilibrium, I mean the system is at rest. If we left it another hour and measured it again, we'd get exactly the same result. And generally when we're talking about equilibrium binding, we're concerned with the midpoint of the curve. And that could be a KD, IC50 and EC50. If we're talking about kinetics, we've added an extra variable into this. So it's the same experiment, we're measuring binding, but now we're looking at it over time. And what we're measuring is an approach to equilibrium. What we see is, as we increase the concentration of our drug, those rates get faster and faster and faster. And what we want to use kinetics to do is link the concentration of the drug to the rate. And what we see in this is that the low concentrations on this graph correspond the concentrations in the middle of the curve on the graph to the left. So this means we probably have to leave this experiment much longer before it would look like the equilibrium experiment on the left. We can take kinetics another step more complicated as well and we could look at the kinetics of how one molecule changes the kinetics of another molecule and this has been used a lot in kinetic threat assays and here we might be looking at blocking a tracer ligand over time. In the blue curve, we've got the tracer ligand binding on its own, and the red curve is the effect of an inhibitor on it. And we can see in the first thousand seconds or so, the inhibitor has no effect on the tracer ligand, but then as time continues, the inhibitor starts to dominate, and we see the tracer ligand dissociate from the receptor. So the question is, why bother doing all of this? So one of the things we can do with kinetics is differentiate compounds. For this equilibrium binding curve, we could have two very different compounds. We could have one compound that got to that equilibrium very quickly, and we can see this with the curves reaching to the top very fast, but when we enter a dissociation phase, they come off very quickly as well. Or we could have that equilibrium driven by a slow dissociation, where we see the curves come up very slowly, but when we enter the dissociation phase, they don't come off at all. We can also use kinetics to solve difficult problems, and one of the ones we've used it for most is interrogating what we call ultra-tight binders. When we think about affinities, we often think of the midpoint of a sigmoid curve as being the affinity. That's only true in a certain set of circumstances. And on this set of graphs on the left, I've got simulated affinities where they're increasing from 10 nanomolar down to a single picomolar. And rather than the curves always shift to the left as the affinity increases, they reach a point where they congregate around the concentration of receptor in the assay. And this is further demonstrated by the graph on the right, where we see the KD and the EC50 of the curves match at unity for the lower affinities. And as we increase affinity, we start to move away from that association of unity until all the EC50s look the same. And so we can separate these curves into three groups. We can have our business of usual curves, which are highlighted here, and where we can use very simple mathematics to 
work out affinities from them. And these are models that you might find in GraphPad Prism. For these curves where we're starting to move away from the line of unity, we can use a bit of mathematical wizardry to analyze them. But for these curves on the right, oh, sorry, these curves here on the left, we, can, we have to use kinetic methods. There's no other way of differentiating them. So if I take one of those curves where we've got a midpoint of 250 picomolar, and I just take these points at the top I've highlighted with a box, they all look the same when we measure them at equilibrium. If we were to measure them kinetically, we'd see they all begin to look quite differently. And we can fit a kinetic model for them and determine the true KD of 10 picomolar. Where these kinetic rates really start to matter is when we put them into the context of a biological system. When we think about a patient who takes a drug, initially when they take it, they'll see an increase of the drug in their system as they absorb the drug from the tablet. This will peak and the concentration of drug will decrease as their body begins to clear it. And in this context, we have to think about our biology for which kinetic rates would matter more. If we think about a target which has a long half-life, a protein that's synthesized and then hangs around in the system for maybe days at a time, we can look at the difference in kinetics. And for a fast on compound, we very rapidly occupy it, but then as the drug concentration falls, we begin to lose our occupancy. Whereas for a slow off compound, we're a bit slower to occupy our target, but then thanks to that very slow off rate, we'll hang around binding it for much longer than our drug is in the system. However, for a target that's got a short half-life, perhaps a protein that's only around for 15 minutes, we see very rapid binding for our fast on compound, and we're able to occupy it much in the same way as a target with a long half-life. But for a slow off compound, we're not fast enough to ever really get there. So this is what we try to do with molecular pharmacology. Traditional PKPD models use a variety of rates to predict dosages. And this could be rates of transport across the gut, rates of metabolism by the liver. What we try to do is look at the molecular system that sits around our drug target. And what we think is the, drug, the rates of absorption and distribution and metabolism are all really important, but the intricacies of the kinetics around our target are of equal importance when we start to understand the dosage. So I've spoken a lot about kinetics and where we try to apply them. I like to talk about how we try and measure them. And accuracy is absolutely key here. And we've got a few options. One option is to sit in a lab sampling an experiment. This is very laborious, boring, not particularly accurate. Another option is to use SPR. Now, SPR really remains the gold standard for measuring kinetics. And it's very, very good at very simple systems. So a, a protein attached to a chip and flowing a drug over. If we want to do anything more complex, perhaps using a whole cell or using a system of four or more proteins, it becomes difficult to use Biocore. Now my colleagues would say that it's not impossible, but it's certainly difficult. But for these complex systems, we've invested in using a ferrostar, which allows us to use normal plate-based assays, but get accuracy that's comparable to a biocore system. The way it allows us to do this is by having two injectors, which allow us to start an assay and measure it at the same time. And that's using one injector. If using the second injector, we can inject a sink and get a dissociation phase. And without measuring these dissociation phases, we may miss complex kinetics. And what's also really important about these systems is that they're able to capture rapid events in the first few seconds and have microsecond long measurements. And this is real data on the right here. This isn't simulated, it was uh, captured by one of our apprentices. And you can see this change in linearity from the, we see in the blue line as it changes from matching the red line, happens within the first 60 seconds. And that would be almost impossible without a stop flow machine if we didn't have the ferrostar. So once we've captured our kinetics, we need to model it. And my advice here is to use a model that's exactly as complicated as you need. For this example from before, the enzyme data, we could use quite a simple model to explain that change in velocity of the enzyme. If we want to do something like kinetic threat, we have to use a slightly more complicated model. 
And then for some of the work we've done looking at allosteric modulators, we use very complex models which can amount to 500 lines of code. But in each instance, we had a specific question we needed to answer, and we derived a model which allowed us to answer that specific question. So just to sum up my introduction, um, I feel that kinetics have come a long way in drug discovery from chasing long off-rate compounds. This kinetic information is most useful when we think about it in the context of a biological system. Accuracy is absolutely key when measuring kinetics, and we use the Ferrostar FSX to do that with normal plate-based assays. And finally, a little bit of maths goes a long way if you want to derive a model. So I feel I've spoken enough about the theory and perhaps it's really good now to get into a case study and show where some of this has actually been useful in real drug discovery programs. So one of the problems when we run small molecule projects is that when we compare our assays, we can see very weak correlations. And this is because small molecule projects rely on a cascade of assays with increasing complexity. And in the instance I've shown here on the left, we're comparing a reporter gene assay with a complex co-culture assay. The reporter gene assay is very much an abstraction. We leave our drug with our target for a number of hours, drop it on top of some cells, and measure an output. Our complex co-culture, we have an endogenous production of our target and signaling. And so realistically, they're very different uh, propositions. And when we correlated them, we saw quite a poor correlation. And in fact, if we remove the top and the bottom points from these correlations, we saw absolutely zero correlation. Now, there's three things you can do here. You can either say, one assay is wrong, we're just going to pick one and go with that. You can throw your hands up and say, this is difficult, it's what happens, it doesn't matter. Or you can investigate why these two assays might be giving us different results. Not to say they're probably both right, but they're telling us different things. And to do this, we thought understanding the occupancy and the kinetics of it might help us. So to measure the occupancy of a small molecule of a protein in a complex system, you need some sort of tool to do that. And to do that, we've generated complex specific antibodies. These are antibodies that recognize the conformation of a protein when it's bound to a small molecule. And these are incredibly useful because you can throw them into any assay, any system, and you'll be able to measure when your protein is bound to your small molecule. In order to use these antibodies, we had to have a mathematical model that would explain the kinetics of our system. And to do this, we describe the system as our protein having an invisible equilibrium between a form which wasn't able to bind our small molecule and a form that was. And this meant that once it was in the form that could bind our small molecule, there was an association rate for the small molecule, an association rate for the antibody. If the protein was bound to the small molecule or the antibody, it stabilized it such that the other partner was more able to bind. And so we used a value called alpha to explain that change. And when we view this kinetically, we see this as the small molecule is able to make the antibody associate more rapidly. And we, so we designed some assays from this where we could throw our target, our cells with our target, our antibody, and our small molecule together and derive meaningful kinetics from it. We see these green dots here representing the antibody binding on its own, and the red dots show the effect the small molecule has on it. The blue dots show what pre-incubating the system of a very high concentration to, of small molecule to drive equilibrium is. And we can see when we compare these two small molecules, the blue lines are almost identical. And that means both of them were able to increase the rate of antibody binding the same amount at equilibrium. But we see the red lines are quite different. And what this is telling us is that some small molecules are able to bind our target much faster. And this was interesting because in an SPR assay, they all look near identical. So this is telling us something about the architecture of our cell means that some small molecules are able to access it much better than others. So, did this information actually do anything to explain the difference in our assays? Here's our original correlation again. And if we look at the correlation between our on-rate and the complex co-culture assay, again, it's very weak. There's not really much there. 
And that's because the on rate is only really one half of the kinetic equation. We'd need the off rate as well. And if we compare the on rate and the reported gene IC50, there's zero correlation at all. And in the absence of being able to measure an off rate in our cell assay, we can combine our gross measure of potency, which is the reported gene assay, and our on rate. And we see, in fact, now we can predict our very complex assay perfectly. And all we've done here is combine the inf kinetic information with the gross measure of potency that's a reported gene assay. And that tells us to work in the co-culture assay, you need both a combination of affinity and ability to access your target. So this is perhaps quite an abstract thing, and it's not obvious other than perhaps it will tell us how to choose a better compound for an assay. In our next example, I'd like to talk about how we can make better predictions for how drugs will work in patients. But before I do that, I'll have to talk a little bit about allosteric modulators. Allosteric modulators are a type of small molecule inhibitor that UCB has invested a lot in being able to understand. We have an absolutely brilliant structural biology, medicinal chemistry, and computational chemistry department. We're able to design brilliant allosteric modulators. And they're also really interesting to us pharmacologists because they, the way they behave is perhaps a little unexpected. When we think about a competitive inhibitor, one of the properties of them is that they are always able to shift an EC50 of binding of a ligand. So on this graph, we see a blue line of an EC50 of A ligand, and as we put in increasing amounts of inhibitor, this EC50 always shifts to the right. For an allosteric modulator, however, it's able to shift that EC50, but the reach is a hard ceiling where, despite putting more modulator in, we can't shift it anymore. The reason this is interesting for us when we think about inhibitors is if we flip this system on its head and talk about an IC50 instead, a competitive inhibitor behaves exactly the same way. It's always able, uh, increasing the amount of ligand is always able to shift the IC50, but crucially, by putting more competitive inhibitor in, we can always go to 100% inhibition. For an allosteric modulator, this is very different. The ligand does shift the IC50 a bit, but after a while, the IC50 stops shifting and the maximum in inhibition collapses. This means in a certain setup of the system, no matter how much inhibitor you put in, you might not get any inhibition. So it's absolutely key to understand the size of this shift to predict how you're gonna behave in vivo. So for one particular allosteric modulator project, we'd started to get a little bit worried. We run our standard dose ratio to see how much our allosteric modulator could shift our EC50, and we found much to our horror that it was only twofold, and a twofold shift isn't particularly good. Well, what we noticed was that these were very, very steep slopes, and that told us that it might be an ultra tight binding between the two proteins. We could try fitting to ligand depletion models and doing a bit of mathematical wizardry. But in these ultra tight models, this would give you very inconsistent results. So instead, we took the same press assay and ran it kinetically using the Ferrostar. So we started with a dose response where we've got an EC50 of about one nanomolar, and we've run this in a kinetic format where we have an association and a dissociation phase. And this tells us, in fact, this system had an affinity of 50 picomolar. That's a quite a large difference that we would have been misled unless we could run kinetically. Equally, this system told us that the dissociation phase was biphasic. And we can see this because the dissociation is first driven by a very fast event, which turns into a very slow event on the approach to zero. So what we really wanted from this is a way of telling how good our compounds were. So we derived a mathematical model which could analyze the effect of a compound in this system, and we applied it. And we see here where we've used our equilibrium method and got a twofold shift, fairly pathetic. When we run it kinetically, we see a very different shape curve, but it fits to our model very, very well. And this told us there was in fact a 60-fold shift in affinity, which is quite a lot better for the project. The other advantage of this, it gives us an idea of the rate of onset of this effect. And when we apply all this information to a PKPD model, we see something very important. 
Our equilibrium model was only predicting about 60% efficacy for maximum in vivo, and we knew we needed to get at least 80% to have any sort of efficacy in a patient, whereas the kinetic model told us we were closer to, much closer to 100%. The other advantage is that the equilibrium model told us it would take about a month of constant dosing of this compound before we'd get to that maximum effect, whereas the kinetic threat said, actually, you'll see that effect in about three days. Those are two very different propositions for a patient. And we did that without developing a new assay. We didn't make any new molecules. We just took our existing assay and ran it kinetically. So to summarize the talk, kinetic measurements allow us to differentiate different drug molecules. They inform us about the rates of binding and the mechanism of the molecules. But this information finds real, real value in the context of a biological system. We can use it to explain discrepancies between assays, or we can use it to give very different PKP predictions to equilibrium methods. Well, thank you very much for listening. I'm quite keen to take any questions. Okay, thank you, uh, both Catherine and Martin, for excellent presentations there. Um, ladies and gentlemen, if you still want to send some questions in, we have got hopefully time to answer them all. Um, I'd like to start off, Martin, with one for you. Um, the literature and data you presented seems to be post hoc analysis. Uh, how would you apply this to a live project? Thanks, Robert. So I think it's absolutely right that it is a post hoc analysis of um, drug discovery programs that have happened before. What we should do is learn from it are the sort of experiments we should run alongside screening or alongside other PK studies, which will allow us to better predict the action of drugs before we go to a clinical trial. So they're reasonably simple experiments um, which we've learned from analysing in the past, which we can apply for work in the future. Okay. Um, and this might be one for you, Catherine. Uh, it could be Martin, I'm not sure. Um, how do you find the, or how does the TR fret sensitivity compare between the Ferrostar and the Clariostar? I'll, I'll, I'll start on that one. <laughs> um, with respect to the Clario star and the Ferro star, they detect time resolved fluorescence in different ways. So when we use the Ferro star, we have red shifted photon counting detectors. Now this can give um, quite a significant improvement in performance for TR threat. So whilst the Clario star is a very good uh, TR threat reader, for those of you that may have used HRF in the past and know about Delta S, for example, if you were to look at, say, a high cyclic AMP standard, you might expect to get around a percentage Delta F of around 900 to 1,000 on a Clarion star. That could easily be 1,200 to 1,300 on a Ferro star. Um, because of the red shifted detectors and match detectors and also the photon counting element. Also with the Ferrostar, we have um, the high energy laser that I talked about, and that can be really important for getting the speed advantage, for, especially for kinetic assays. So we can get a lot um, of energy in with very few flashes. So I don't know, Martin, if you, if you compared the flash lamp to the laser in your earlier trials? We, we have used flash lamp and laser for kinetic experiments. Generally, the laser much outperforms the, the flash lamp. You can, with a lot of flashes, get similar data to the laser, but it slows down the read, so it's not as preferable. Yeah. So, I mean, we're starting from a standard of good. So the Clara style is pretty good. Um, the Ferris star, even flash lamp better, and the laser is going to give you the added speed and be even better again. Hopefully that answers the question. Oh, good. Okay. Um, another one. I'm not sure who this one or who would like to answer this one, but um, do your PKP 
PD predictions, I presume this is you, Martin, use the individual kinetic rate constants, i.e. on and off rates, uh, or just the more accurately determined KI values? Uh, great question. So we always try to use the kinetic rate constants over the equilibrium KI value. The equilibrium KI value is what you get if you leave something for long enough. One of the problems in vivo is that the concentration isn't constant. So we're thinking about an approach to equilibrium, and not only is that level of binding changing over time, but also the concentration that drives it is changing over time. So the only way you can really just predict the accurate effects of that is to use the kinetic rate constants. I hope that answers the question. All right, another one for you, I think, Martin. How do you address general uh, ligand depletion, i.e. greater than 10% bound, and the effect of micropharmacokinetics on kinetic measurements and data analysis um, and the interpretation for these small volume assays? Brilliant. That's a, an excellent question. And it is difficult to model ligand depletion. The way that we do it is we don't rely on the standard maths or standard equations you might find in graph pad prism. And equally, we try not to use things like the Morrison equation for looking at equilibrium measurements of ligand depletion. Although they can work in some situations, they generally tend not to be very accurate. Instead, we derive models based on the project and based on the biological system and we try to describe it kinetically using a series of ordinary differential equations, which can account for the, the changes in amount of ligands. So they're completely mass balanced. Uh, and then we use a mathematical framework called Run Cutter to solve them, which allows you to go straight from a differential equation to a fit on a graph without actually having to find the analytical solution. So it's, it's fairly technical stuff. Um, there is some software that allows you to do all of this without ever seeing a bit of maths. Um, and that's called Biokin, uh, which is uh, available online. But we tend to just write the equations ourselves. Um, I hope that answers the question. Good. All right. Um, so I have another one here. Um, how common do you think uh, slow-off rates are in a typical set of drug candidates? Okay, I think I can try and answer that one as well. So what we've seen, and this is really empirical, is certainly there may be uh, exceptions to this, but generally if you discover a compound or a small molecule that binds to a protein, you tend to get the forward rate constant or the on rate constant that you're given. And as you optimize that, you tend to extend the off rate. So you tend to make as a compound becomes more potent, it gets a slower and slower off rate with the on rate remaining relatively constant. So if you've discovered a small molecule with a slow on rate, if you make it very potent, you'll end up with a long off rate as a product of making it very potent. And then realistically, a long off rate is all relative to the biological system. And certainly drugs like antibodies have incredibly long off rates. Um, but I hope that goes some way to answering it. I think ultimately, if you've got a very potent drug, it's likely it will have a long off rate. Good, thank you. Um, another one here for you, probably once again, Martin. Um, do we need special software to analyze the raw kinetic data? Um, again, brilliant question, and it depends on how complicated you want your analysis to be and what the question you're asking is. So it's a very, very simple analysis. You can even analyze it on the Mars software that comes with the Ferristar. If you get more complex and you're interested in fitting simple on and off rates of a drug binding to a receptor with nothing else there, you can use GraphPad Prism or other graphing softwares. And as you get really complicated towards the end uh, of the talk where I spoke about uh, that reasonably complex allosteric model, at that point you either have to make the software yourself or buy very specialized software. Uh, I mentioned earlier Biokin is 
some very good software for doing this. Uh, I can say at this stage, a little bit of a sneak peek, hopefully some of you guys will be coming to the SLAS meeting next year, but we'll be uh, launching some new Ferristar software there that will help us to further interrogate some of these kinetics uh, for Ferristar. Um, so do come along and find out a bit about that from us um, at that meeting or speak to your local representatives um, at the beginning of next year. Good. Thanks, Catherine. Um, one more here. Um, what would be the impact of running full diversity screens in kinetic mode in terms of speed and protein consumption? Oh, brilliant. Without knowing the system, it's really hard to say for protein consumption. What we've found is that compared to a biocore, you will use more protein. That's because there's a very small amount of bio a protein attached to a biocore chip. However, the Ferristar is much faster than the biocore in most applications. And that's because we can read multiple wells at once. So I think as a really general answer without knowing the system that's being spoken about, you'd use more protein, but you'd do it quicker. I think the big advantage of the ferrous star if you were to try and do this would be that you're looking at the kinetics of modulation of the system. So you're getting some idea of how you're changing it, uh, a ligand binding event, for example. And it's more difficult to screen like that for a full diversity set on a biocore, but certainly not impossible. All right. Um, okay, another one here. Um, what are the advantages to using FRET kinetics versus SPR? Okay, so there's another good question. Um, so with FRET, we can add in more components than a biocore, and we can also look at very, very long association periods. So some of the data I showed, we looked at an association period of eight hours. That would be very hard to do on a biocore because you're limited by the injection volume. Uh, equally, we've done experiments where we've had four or five different proteins interacting with each other, and we can use FRET to measure just one of those interactions and how the other proteins affect uh, that one interaction, whereas on a biocore, you're measuring a gross change in mass. That's not to say that these experiments are by any means impossible on biocores. They're definitely, it definitely can be done. It's in some circumstances we choose a Ferristar over the Biocore. Another big advantage for me, though, is that it's very easy to get your data off a of Ferristar and analyze it in third-party software or analyze it even in Excel. Biocore, there's quite a few steps involved if you're going to do this in a high-throughput manner. Okay. Um... What if you don't have a continuous assay? Should we restrict ourselves to those continuous assays? Absolutely not. Um, we've run kinetics on non-continuous assays before. It's a lot more work. Uh, and the way, one way you can handle it is by having a robot start the assay all at once and then stop different wells at different times and you can get an idea of kinetic traces from that. Um, and it really depends how important kinetics are to your project. The examples I gave today, it was very important, but if your project's otherwise going fine and you only have an uh, endpoint assay, I wouldn't break your back trying to get a kinetic one. All right, good, okay. Um, Another one for you, Martin. How often do you get to choose the kinetics or mechanism of a compound? Um, obviously, difficult projects may have limited hits. What do you do then? Another good question. Um, uh, it's a situation I've been in myself quite a lot. But on a very hard target, you may only have one real hit, and those are the kinetics you're given, and that's a mechanism you've discovered. It doesn't mean that measuring all these things is not going to help you. Instead of being used to pick the best compound, then it's a type of risk forecasting. By knowing this, you will know potential problems you could 
experience later down the line and try and influence your design and strategy as well as other sort of assay development and clinical strategies around the way that your compound acts rather than waiting for a nasty surprise at some point. <laughs> um, question for you, Catherine, I think. Um, can you measure rapid kinetics using different assay technologies such as BRET or FP? Yes, um, all the data uh, mainly shown by Martin's, uh, produced by Martin's team today has been in a TR FRET format. Um, BRET is emerging um, as a potential alternative, especially in cellular um, whole cell systems uh, for looking at interactions. And fluorescence polarization um, for some, you know, it, it, we're not able to work with the injector on a sort of a stop flow basis, but we are able to see some interactions utilizing fluorescence polarization probes as well, sort of over the seconds in, in terms of time period as well. So yes, um, TR is not the only option you have, um, but it has seemed to be a very successful um, setup for, for the type of work as the alternative to SPR as Martin's team of use here. Okay, another one for you, Martin. Um, Sounds like a silly question, really. Why not just find something that works in a more biologically relevant assay and then work this stuff out later? Uh, well, <laughs> <a> statement. <laughs> I think it's an interesting statement, though. And I think it it's really speaking to the two ways of doing drug discovery. One is very phenotypic. You're ultimately interested in the, the biological response and you want to check that's exactly right all the way through. The second way is targeted uh, drug discovery, where you absolutely believe in the target. Um, neither way is right or wrong, in my opinion, so it's a perfectly valid way of working. What you have to be absolutely sure of, though, is that relevant biological assay is completely representative of what's going on in a patient. We still design our assays to give us a signal and to work day in, day out. And that could mean that we're putting too much of a ligand in or too little of a ligand. Um, we could have changed the cells in some way that we can't really quite predict. Maybe the, the drug has worked really well at equilibrium in this uh, biologically relevant assay, but is very, very slow to bind. So without doing this kind of work as well and doing it early, we won't ever really be sure if uh, if we've got a drug. Yeah, good point. Fair enough. No, it's very good. Um, one, I think, for you, Catherine, um, you said that the TRF laser on the Ferrostar has a speed advantage. What is the fastest sampling rate of the reader in TR fret mode? Okay, so I think I gave some figures uh, during my talk that, you know, were you to read HTRF on a sort of fly mode, you could even read a 1536 well plate in around 36 seconds. So it's very, um, very quick in, in, in what we can detect. Um, if you need to work with um, faster time courses, maybe something's happening over literally a period of seconds, it is possible for us to sort of read smaller portions of the plate at a faster read um, collection rate. Um, that way we can capture ultra-fast kinetics. And then we have the capability to, if you like, stitch together runs, so to automate um, reading different sections of the plate one after the other, so you can still collect one plate's worth of data. Um, and that way you sort of can obtain the very, very fastest kinetic readouts um, for the whole plate with that sort of walk away capability. So that's how we're currently working with this. Again, um, a little bit of a sneak peek. Come and chat to us come the new year because we are looking at ways that we can sort of work in a well mode style approach to even determine more rapid um, TR fret kinetics using the ferrostar so we can really interrogate even the fastest um, on and off rates um, come the future. So, yeah, come and speak to us about it. Okay, last question of the day. And once again, Catherine, you're on the spot. Um, you said that the fastest measurement of a plate with the laser takes 36 seconds. 
What happens in case my binding kinetic is faster and I have a full plate to measure? Do I have to read the whole plate every time? So I think hopefully I've answered that with, with my previous answer. Um, so yes, you don't have to read the full plate. You can define as much or as little of the plate as you like. And as I said before, um, if you're if you read the number of wells you can within the kinetic time that you wish to measure, um, and our software can stitch together multiple reads to give you that one plate of data at the end with either a portion of the plate or a whole plate read. So no problem there. Excellent. All right. Look, look, looks like we've run out of time. Um, thanks again to both of our speakers today. Um, I'm being asked whether this uh, there are slides available or recordings available. Um, we will be putting the whole webinar onto the Drug Discovery World website in the next day or so. Uh, and the website address is www.ddw-online.com. That's ddw-online.com, where you'll be able to download that and listen to it all over again and look at the slides so uh, once again a big thank you to our speakers um, and uh, also to you uh, our, our listeners and uh, also to our sponsor BMG Lab Tech uh, ladies and gentlemen I wish you a good day and um, hope you have uh, a very merry Thanksgiving in America Christmas coming up in other parts of the world and other celebrations enjoy thank you very much goodbye